Hey, Chicago, Saturday, May 6th, 4 p.m. at bric brac Records. I'm doing a live podcast. It's two blocks down from the AAW show that night in Logan Square. It's also free. Come and enjoy the fun time. But for now, enjoy the show. This is the Art of Wrestling with professional wrestler Colt Cabana. How you guys doing? Come on in, sit down, relax. You're about to listen to The Art of Wrestling, a professional wrestling podcast. It's a live podcast. It's personal journals and entryway into the minds, the souls, the hearts, and the lives of the people involved in the world of professional wrestling. I'm your host. My name is Colt Cabana. I am a podcaster. I'm an entertainer. I am a commentator. I like to think I'm a pretty decent guy. Most importantly, though, I am a professional wrestler, and I am sitting here live in my studio apartment in Chicago, Illinois. Before I go any further, there's a fan support and listener support a podcast supported by people just like you. Give it to you free of charge every single Thursday on ColtCommander.com, iTunes, SoundCloud, wherever you get your podcasts from. A couple great ways that you can support, rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes, please. Tell a friend, tweet it out, Facebook it out, Instagram it out. Best way that you can support, though, ColtMerch.com, DigitalColt.com, t-shirts, buttons, pictures, posters, DVDs, digital downloads, micro brawlers, headbands, Wrestling Road Diaries 3, ColtMerch.com, DigitalColt.com. You know, last week I said I was in Arizona, I was seeing my parents, I was wrestling for Party Hard, but I forgot to say, I mean, I didn't forget to say, it just didn't come up, but now as I sit over here and I look uh, right next to my bed, I could see the Justin Roberts autobiography, his book, which I did mention that I got in my P.O. Box a couple uh, couple weeks back, but I got to spend some time with Justin, we got to hang out, I forgot how good it was to see him, and what it's like once you're not in that machine, it's hard. I mean, that machine, it'll take you around the world, it'll make you famous, it'll make you cool opportunities, and then uh, when you're out of the machine, you really got to make the opportunities for yourself, and Justin has this book, it's sitting next to me, a lot of great pictures, a lot of great, and he told me Dave Bogart helped him kind of rearrange the pictures, and I thought that was cool, because that's like in the community, everyone's helping each other, everyone's scratching each other's back, so I'll, you know, I'll give some love to Justin, and I'm sure it's a great book, like... I mean, I haven't read a book in probably 10 years. I, I'd got to say 10 years. I mean, I know I read the Mick Foley book in college. And I remember reading a lot of the British wrestling guys' books. So that was probably 10. That was over 10 years. But I have this book, and I'm going to get to it, I think. You know, with all the stuff with JBL that's come out recently, you know he's telling it like it is. And so that's very intriguing. And I know Justin's story. He's been on this podcast before while he was in WWE. But uh, just, you know, I don't know. My friend wrote a book. Probably be cool to read it. Also, quick little shout out to Martin Hines at the Metro in the UK. He wrote a nice little article that uh, showed up in my Twitter box today. He put over myself, Bruce Pritchard, and Brian Alvarez and Dave Meltzer's podcast. So that's always nice to see in print. Thank you very much, Martin. And a little shout out to Kenny Doan slash Dykstra, who is on the show this week. Kenny is my uh, guest. He was in the Spirit Squad. That's probably best how you knew him. He had a little run after that. And then I think he was on the very first Evolve show. That's how the timing of that came about. And uh, recently showed up back on WWE television doing some stuff with Ziggler and The Miz. And we don't get into that. But he has an interesting story. It's kind of fun that him and Jeff Hardy were both recently on this podcast within the same amount of time. Both guys who wrestled super young within their careers on WWE television. And by super young, I mean high schoolers. They were high schoolers. I couldn't even imagine. I mean, it was my dream when I was in high school to be on WWE television. But I didn't train. I didn't get into it that young. So it wasn't a a reality. Like, I dreamed of going to watch wrestling, not be on the television. So it's, uh, it's always super interesting for me to hear about people who get a lot of success early in professional wrestling, how it goes to their head, if it goes to their head, where they are, where you know what they become. For me, you know, I'm me and Les Kellett will tell you how it is to be successful late in our career. Uh, if you don't know who Les Kellett is, you should definitely know him. Listen to my Howl Show Pro Wrestling Fringe where we talk about how he became successful at 58 years old. I mean, he was successful before that, but that was like the height of his legendariness. So, you know, I got uh, I got 20 years to get there, and I'm excited for my big break at, at 57 years old, 56 years old. So enjoy the chat with Kenny. He's a guy I've known for uh, for a long time now, and we were on a bunch of shows, and we sat down and we podcasted. Lots of fun. 
My week was the usual hectic traveling. Of course it is. Of course it is. I did a show in the Maritimes in Nova Scotia. Are those the same places? Probably not. I'm going to say I did a a show in Nova Scotia, and the Maritimes are somewhere next to them? Anyways, a whole day of travel. My flight got canceled. I ended up spending uh, a night in Halifax before making it to Sydney, Canada. Then I got home and I talked to my AT&T dealer and I realized that I was, I'm allowed to have my phone on roaming the whole time. But I kept it off because I thought I'd get charged. Also, I like the fact that I call him my AT&T dealer like he's selling me AT&T like it's something illegal. Yeah, his name's Pedro. He's on the block. He's my AT&T dealer. He hooks it up. And uh, ACWA, that's what I did. It was a fun show. You know, something about those guys out there. And it can't be like a poor me type thing. It's, it's kind of the same thing that I used to talk about for the UK wrestlers, it was like, there's so many good UK wrestlers, but they all, in order to break or whatever it might be, have to come to America. And it was always my hope that they could just make their own thing where they'd be successful in their own country and they could be stars and they could be rich or well-paid or whatever it might be. And like now, you know, this was years later, it's like almost starting to come true or to fruition a lot of those guys are getting very successful coming to Japan and coming to America, and there's more of them that are doing it. But hopefully, you know, with the ITV thing or even the What Culture thing and the Rev Pro shows getting huge at York Hall, something clicks where they become huge stars in the UK and they don't, they can just stay there. And that's the same with the guys uh, in the Maritimes, Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, it's a good crew up there with good wrestlers that know what they're doing, but it's just, it's almost hidden to one area, and it's so hard for them to say hey america look at us look what we're doing and this is everywhere in canada and you look at the guys who became something i guess the what the canadian ones omega went to japan guys like bobby Roode and eric young tna and even you know the two big maritime guys brody Steele and mike hughes mike who i've had on the show before brody who keeps on dodging me um they just do international shit, and that's how, how they get big. They tried to do something with a wrestling reality show years ago, Wrestling With Reality, which is on the Fight Network, long before uh, they became Anthem and bought out TNA. But hopefully one day for those guys, there's a lot of talented wrestlers up there that something pops within the region, and they don't need American buzz or Japanese buzz or whatever it might be. Also, that's my new favorite wrestler, Japanese buzz. I also then flew home from that crazy trip just to get back on an airplane, fly again, and then drive another two hours to Cape Girardeau, which I thought was known for something, right? I, we've all heard the name Cape Girardeau. I was like, why do I know it? What's it known for? And they're like, nothing. It's a shitty little town in between St. Louis and Memphis. It's just Cape Girardeau, to which I said, okay. And then I wrestled their show, and then I went back to Chicago. And that's where I am now. Until I head out on the next trip this week. Business as usual. Okay, we do have a song of the week this week. And it's brought to you by ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter, it's a search engine for finding and posting jobs. Hey, are you a place or a business or a thing? Maybe you're a wrestling company and maybe you need to hire somebody? Posting your job in one place isn't enough to find quality candidates. You need to post your job on all of the job sites. And now you can with ZipRecruiter.com. ZipRecruiter already has 9 million resumes you can search through their database. With one click, send your job to 100-plus job sites, including social media like Twitter and Facebook. There's jobs in any city, any industry, nationwide. No juggling emails or calls to your office. Quickly screen candidates, rate them, and hire the right person. It's used by over 1 million businesses. Featured on Forbes, Wall Street Journal, TechCrunch, CBS, New York Times, and more. Pro Wrestling Tees, they're doing good, good business. Might need to hire some more scrumps over there. Make sure we do it through ZipRecruiter. Right now, you guys, you can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash first. ZipRecruiter.com slash first. One more time, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash first. The song of the week is by Nothead. It's off his album, The Evolution of a Hobbyist. It's available on iTunes, Google Play, and so on and so forth. Support them. Notheadmusic.bandcamp.com. Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram is all Nothead Music. This is a song about one of my least favorite people in the world, but I can appreciate a good, fun wrestling song. It's called Jim Cornette. Enjoy. We'll be back with Kenny Dykstra. Don't. Ken is here with no voice at the moment. Did you were you were you doing cheers too loud? Uh, you know we might have been, we may have been. <laughs> Did you lose that from a night of drinking? 
Yeah, we were yelling. I, I don't know how it got that to that point because I didn't feel. Looking back, put that I, microphone right up to that mouth button. Looking back, I didn't Especially feel with no voice. Yeah, yeah, I did not feel like I was yelling that much, but apparently I was. I was told that you guys, you and Mondo, respectively, the Spirit Squad, were on the dance floor living it up, and the, and some of the wrestlers were like, I don't know what they were on, and I was like, I don't think they were on anything. I think they're just this. That's just who they are. <laughs> that is one hundred percent true. Yeah, we were out there. I was just banging into people, jumping up and down, going crazy. It was pretty cool. Just at what the club? Because hey, we're in England. We might as well. Yeah, I don't know. Might as well. Might as it's well. Saturday night. Let's do it. That's <laughs> what we do. All right. It's fun. It's easy. Are you single? Yes. I'm hitting on you. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I don't know if that would be. Yeah. Okay, yeah. you're a, a man about town, China. Just have live it up, chilling. Yeah, just live it up. But you know what happens usually in those situations is like, if somebody gets like more drunk than me, then I automatically it changes your focus because now you're you're watching, you're babysitting. Okay, you know what I mean? Yeah, not so much babysitting, but you're you have to know. And like, if I'm going out with somebody, like you know, last night we were going out with me and Mondo. I was I was trying to know where he was just because I got to make sure he needs a babysitter he at need, all yeah. times. And it's Mondo. So but you used to work at a. A bar? Did you run a bar? You owned a bar? No, I was a part owner in a bar in Worcester. I had a small stake in it, and then the opportunity came to sell it. How many ounces? Eight ounces? Ten ounces? <laughs> Just, yeah, a few ounces. This? Tell me about the a steak. A cup. One cup. <laughs> one pint. A cup of Aju in the steak? A little bit of pint, yeah. It was a steak joke. Okay. So it was a small little temporary investment, and it worked out good. I made some money on it. Oh, so, really? It was yeah. a turnaround. Yeah, really. Did it was take- just like a small bit. It was more so to invest in it. The like the launch to get it off the ground, mm-hmm. and then once that happened, then they just bought me out and made a little bit. You were side. fine with that, yeah, because I don't want to do the restaurants thing. Yeah, but, but like, if, if like did helping, you? Were you like, I'm gonna, hey, I'm gonna, you know, be a bouncer. I'm gonna be around. I'm gonna be like the guy in the in the thing. No, and this was before I had my master's degree, so it was like, you know, you always try to dabble in things, see what you're good at. And I like a investing. wise man once told us. Uh, a billion, a billionaire averages seven different things of income. Is that I heard correct? that from a very uh, wise man. <laughs> yeah. once said so they have seven. What was it? Seven routes of income? average has seven streams. Streams of income. Services of income. Yeah. Okay. Seven streams. So that was one. Right. But, and that was after w, your WWE thing. Yeah. So was that essentially like, hey, I've got a little money? Yeah. Yeah. And I saved up. I mean, I saved up most of my money. You know, anything that I've bought in uh, was like property. Like, I still have the same vehicle from years and years ago. Yeah. And I just keep patching up the rust holes. And really? Getting, yeah. 240,000 miles on my SUV. Because you, right? So you were one of these guys who got, like, signed really early. Yeah. You were really young. Um, yeah, I was young. Yeah. Young. But, yeah. and you know the stories of, like, oh, these dudes are young and they they yeah. buy a Hummer and they buy right. That's everybody. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Louisville. There were people coming up in Hummers and sports cars and just crazy. A lot of. I could and he was there. I think a little bit for you too. Like I can attest. Like Davari is a good friend of mine. Yeah. And I remember right away he showed up with a Hummer. You Did know? he have a Hummer? Yeah. No way. <laughs> and he was a young. You know, he oh, was wow. super young. Yeah. See, I, I. But I was. I'm always the type where I'm going to invest in something if I can get my money back somehow or mm-hmm. at least close to it. Well, uh, a vehicle you can't do that. Right. Well, where do those attributes come from? Because I'm just saying, being right, poor, being, is that what it is? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How'd you? What was? Where? where? Uh, well, my my mother. It was always me and my mother growing up, and she dropped out in like 11th grade. So you know, jobs were hard. So I would go to different towns for schools each year. I'd Get out somewhere of here. Else, somewhere else. So it's just you and your mom. No siblings. Yeah. I have older siblings, but they had grown up and moved away by then. Okay. Yeah. So we would always move from town to town and wherever. You know, you you can get into an apartment. But after you miss three to six months of payments, you got to move again. Oh, shit. So it was just kind of like, you knew, you know what I mean? But like, then, what was she doing? Serving at Applebee's or something? Mm, she had her own daycare. But then the the state laws changed and she didn't have the education and stuff to actually keep it going. So then she lost that. And then it was just all different jobs. I mean, imagine, too, if you drop out of 11th grade, you're you're kind of limited. And if you'd been doing daycare, mm-hmm. not much of a resume. So what were other just like... Other small uh, jobs? Telemarketing, selling the newspaper. Uh, yeah, a little like waitress here and there, stuff like that. And so what, you were you just one of these kids that just ran around the house by himself? At times, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. But I always watch wrestling, so that's kind of how I fell into it. And uh, so, yeah, that was just... So you were always... I was always investing something, trying. I would, like, even my wrestlers, I would try to, like, sell them for more or, like... 
this is before eBay and stuff. Yeah. So you're you're limited. You're small scale. But yeah, it was and just, where and where and that comes from the idea of like just knowing you have no money and you're trying to get money, or like the idea of like you you saw from your mom that like it yeah, wasn't I there. I think both. I think having no money, saying how can I make money? Yeah, and then you know you read up on these. I would always read biographies of like successful people because you know we're not born successful or talented. But except for me, except for Coke right, ben. I'm just a <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then I would read up on them and I would see like some of them. I, I didn't see the seven streams of income, but I would right. see that they, they they were born like poor or homeless or whatever it be. So to me, it was like, oh, well, then it's well, possible. Well, going back to the guys who get signed, it's it's always two things. It's like it's like if you're, you know, if you're, well, you wouldn't know. I'd say like, well, if your mother was an alcoholic, it's either like you, the people either become a huge alcoholic or you completely stay away. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's also true. Same, I feel it's the same way with people that get signed who are who are poor. It's either they go. Crazy. Full, full yeah. in on they spending that money. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. you, uh, oh, fun. What were some of the, um, okay, so uh, growing up poor, did your mom say, um, hey, don't do not do as I did? Or In some ways, but she she used to always tell me, like, find something that you love to do and find out how to get paid to do it. She said, because someone's getting paid every day to do something. It could be the dumbest thing in the world, but someone's always getting paid to do something. Did she ever go and get her education? Yeah, yeah. Did she so she ended up doing that, taking care of that. So that was good. I mean, she does great now. She's like, uh, I forget what she does. It's something with old elderly. She runs a whole facility now. Okay. So it's cool. So she ended she up likes it. running. Yeah. She was born to do that. Boss people. I guess, yeah. Boss <laughs> old people. Babies and old people. <laughs> and me. Yeah. I don't know. And you. Yeah. So they, well, yeah, she said, find something you love to do and get paid to do it yeah that's when i was like i was like 11 i think and i had these little action figures and i was like oh cool i'll just be a wrestler then <laughs> that, was, that was it i was like okay i know what i'll do but were you were you into wrestling bef- like were the action figures just there because someone had just gotten you a shitload of figures no my earliest memory is wrestling All right yeah like my first favorite as a kid was bam bam bigelow nice and i think because he did a cartwheel and he had flames or something. i don't know why sure. but it was, it was huge big bam bam guy yeah but then when i was 12 I convinced my brother to give me a ride to Stanford. So he gave me a ride to Stanford, and I had to save up, like, gas money. Your brother, who was 20 at that point, right? Just about. Probably older. Okay. Yeah. But he gave me a ride to Stanford, and I was like, this is great. Like, I'm going to be on Ron a week. Like, this is it. Well, come on. Hold I on. Sw- I know. It sounds crazy. Okay. So mm-hmm. you're, you're 11. You figure out you want to be a wrestler. You're 11. Yeah, you figure out you want to be a wrestler. Exactly. Yeah. You're 12. You're getting a ride from Stanford. And I, in your head. In my head, I'm going to be on raw very soon what's gonna happen you're gonna walk through that door it, yeah it's naive i'm gonna walk through the door yeah i'm gonna ask for an application i'm gonna fill it out i'm gonna get interviewed vince is gonna realize i'm good and i don't know i didn't think too much beyond that <laughs> how would he know <laughs> right like, and i'm 12 and did you picture a wrestler or did you like ba- a backstage interviewer kid or were you like I, I don't know I, that's the thing i didn't think i just thought they'll find something for me <laughs> Yeah, creative will have something for me. Creative, yeah. yeah. I'm not creative, the guy. I'm not getting hired to do that. I'm getting hired to perform. <laughs> Great. So I walked in. Wait, hold on. Did you picture like wrestling the warlord at a 12? I like, don't know. Oh, I'll just wrestle warlord. I don't know. And barbarian. It, yeah, right. These 40 year old men. Yeah. I, I don't know. At you know, 12, okay. I don't know what I was picturing. I love I it. I didn't picture that much, though. <laughs> Clearly. So we get there, everything's going great. The door is unlocked. I go in the front office. Everything's great. I ask for an application. And lady just asked me why I'm not in school. And I was like, well, I need, I'm here to get an application. And she's like, for what? And I was like, to be a wrestler. She's like, that's not how you do it. She's like, you find a wrestling school. You train. You send stuff. We'll call you. How did she know? Uh, she knew. Because I was like, well. Because that lady was Linda McMahon. <laughs> right, yeah. She knew, clearly. And then she was just like, you can't be in here. Like, get out. I don't even know why the door's unlocked. So I guess the door happened to be unlocked, and it was just lucky. But <clears throat> neither did I get the application. And then, uh, so she didn't give me a list of schools either. So She didn't find one thing adorable about this? Clearly not. No, she healed me. Really? Yeah. You would think, like, here's some w- a WWF magazine, right? Oh, no, I got the magazine. But I, mean, but I already had it, because I had a subscription. <laughs> yeah, so I was pissed. Right. I, was like, I already have this one. She like so she like didn't find it adorable. She was kind of annoyed by it. Yeah, like I was just wasting her time. That's kind of sad. Yeah, she healed me out. Should have been a sign. Okay, but uh, so then I was like, I walk out and I was like, well, I gotta find a school. That's what I gotta do. And I wasn't depressed or anything because afterwards, my brother was asking me similar questions like, 
wait, what did you think was going to happen? Like, <laughs> yeah. Did you think you were going to be on a plane? He didn't like, ask you this question before, as you were driving there? He might have, but I think I had to see it for myself. Gotcha. It became a realization. Now yeah. you actually heard the questions being asked by him. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So then uh, I went home and I looked up schools, like, you know, di- dial up AOL stuff. Mm-hmm. And somehow did you get in those chat across. rooms? Yeah. I, were you in, uh, like, were you, the AOL chat rooms... Like with the old people, like you're, because I was. Well, 12. I don't know who they were. Re- well, I remember being twelve and like talking with like people that were like thirty. I remember I was talking about like wrestling stuff, but then like there were all these code words and shit, uh. and I didn't know what it meant. So I was like, I'm not sure what the hell we're doing here. <laughs> and then by then it was boring anyways because I had a lot of friends. So. Oh, what are you saying about me? Oh well, no, you have me made up friends on there. I was challenging people to trivia questions in the WWF really? uh, spotlight room or whatever on AOL. Do you know all the WrestleMania main events? Up uh, to a certain point, probably, yeah. And at that point, when I was twelve, it was like it wasn't. It was WrestleMania twelve oh, or whatever, yeah, right? So yeah, 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 yeah. And I'd be like, ugh. I mean, what a smart Mark nerd I was. I was like, ugh, oh, yeah. you don't even know that Killer Khan was in all Japan, right? You know, like that. See, I didn't know about the Japan scene. Yeah, and I didn't know a lot about that. I barely knew about WCW. Right. So I was a straight WWF guy. All right. But uh, so that well, so then I found Kowalski School, and I went up there. And he trained Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday. And I walked in at 13, and I had saved up money by then. Doing what? Uh, lawn work, you know, just... Trading figures. Stuff. Trying. <laughs> that didn't really work out too well for me. But, uh, yeah, so I just saved I up could, a lot of money. I could see you... Be, there was a guy at my school who would always, like, scam me on baseball cards. I could see you being that guy. Oh, I... Like, I, I once would. traded, like, a Sid Bream for, like... Because Sid Bream was, like, he won the World Series that year, but his card mm-hmm. was shit, and I traded him for, like, a... Steve Carlton, like rookie card or something, you know, like something amazing. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Oh, I can see you being the guy. At the I scammer. would totally do that. Yeah. yeah. Well, me and my other buddy uh, in school, there was a, a little convenience store down the street, and the truck would come and lift up the gate. And when he would go in, one of us would go in and like ask him a question or something just to stall him. And the other one would just grab a box out the back of the truck. Ooh, that's a different kind of uh, yeah, it's like a deal heist. there. <laughs> and you never know what you got until you open it. It's like, oh, we got Snickers. Like, and we go to school like and sell for a dollar. You just grab a random dollar. box? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we go to school and sell candy for a dollar. Yeah. So Did that ever catch up with any of you guys? No. That's just, a bad habit. Like, just stopped. But that's how habits start. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Right? Yeah. Luckily, Absolutely. you stopped there. Yeah. If, uh, <clears throat> now I go for potato chips but i i remember i once oh i don't mean eating habits i oh, mean no, no, thieving habits chips. yeah no, i once i once shoplifted a, a game boy game and i remember walking out and being like i was i was in a, i don't know if you That's had a, a shop, tough one though. i had a shoplifting phase not like crazy i think all kids try yeah and i shoplifted the game boy game and it had uh the metal tag on it mm. and for some reason it didn't go off interesting and to me that was like a sign of like uh. i should stop doing this because you got away with it. Because I got away. And, like, yeah. that should have went yeah. off. And that's when I called it a day. Yeah. Not you, though. You you were, you, were, no. you had a scheme. I was, made, I was making the money. <laughs> I was making money on it. So, uh, what else? What was I saying? Oh, so Kowalski's, I went there, and I had money. This is how you got the money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then I was like, I want to sign up for the school. Oh, first of all, when you get there, it's on the third floor. And it's, like, rickety and old. And you hear people screaming. And you hear Kowalski shouting, schmuck, schmuck. Get up. And, um, and I was like, I remember I stopped at the second floor and was like, I need to really decide. Like, mm. right now, if I want to keep going. Who took I'm, you there? My brother. Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, so I walked in, and I was like, I'm here to be a wrestler. And he said, leave. Come back when you're 18. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, Mr. Kowalski, listen, you got to understand. I was like, if you train me now, I said, in five years, I'll get a job because I'll only be 18, and I'll have all that experience. And he was like, maybe so. He's like, okay. He's like, come back. Uh, he's like, I need a paper from your parents saying that you won't sue me when I beat the hell out of you. Yeah. And I want all the money up front. Did you know who Killer Kowalski <clears throat> was? Yeah. Yeah. How did you know who he was? 96 Hall of Fame. Oh, okay. As a kid watching. All right, yeah. nice. <laughs> yeah. So then the next the next day, I got the paper from my mother, and I did the form, gave him all cash. Yeah. And he was like, okay. How much was it? Uh, 2200 Fuck it. And you had 2200 as a 13-year-old. Yeah. Well, with birthday money. Saved up over years and like little side candy bar. Yeah, gigs. but you decided at twelve that this was only a year's worth. Yeah, so that was well, a I, had, I had money saved before. Yeah, because I never really. The only other purchase I bought in my life before that was like a bike when I was like seven. Wasn't your mom like, "Hey, we're poor. I could use that twenty two hundred? No, because she never. She never knew how much money I had. 
<clears throat> I would just always go to the bank, do it myself. Mattress money or right, under the mattress. Random, yeah. Random areas. But so then so I wait, that. I want to know his uh, Killer Kowalski's reaction when you plop down twenty two hundred dollars. He no sold it. He was just like, okay, thank you. Go warm up in the corner. And how scary? Because Killer Kowalski is like six eight. Yeah, he's big. Giant he was still man. big dude. Then you weren't. I mean, I I'm get I get it from now that the confidence has always been high with you. For some yep. reason, I don't know why, <laughs> but <laughs> but you had were you not like uh, Jesus Christ? Oh yeah, I'm a kid and yeah. this is a grown man. Yeah, I was I was nervous because I you know you hear stuff about like Stu Hart's dungeon mm-hmm. stuff and I was like eh, let's see how this is. So then he'd make me go warm up in the corner for like a month. I wasn't allowed in the ring, and he'd come over and teach me how to chain wrestle. So it was like. I'm going to show you this. But even when he's showing you chain wrestling moves, is it kind of like weird? This old man is like... No, I don't think so. No, it doesn't work. I, I think because everybody respected him there, so it was like he has the knowledge. There was never a doubt that this is weird. No, but just like this old man is kind of manhandling this 13-year-old. Yeah, well, what's even weirder is I was like the bump guy. So like A-Train was getting ready to go up. Yeah. Or he may have already debuted, but he was he would come back every once in a while. So when he needed to try stuff out... I was the smallest and the lightest. And same thing with Saturn when he was off with ECW. He'd come back and try to. I was going to ask who was there. Yeah. Yeah. Cronus, all those guys. Oh, my favorite. It was pretty cool. Do you love John Cronus? He was cool. He was, I mean, I didn't really know him. him. Well, I was just more like quiet, the guy who get in the ring, let's try this. Yeah. But he was always nice and respectful. Right. But, I mean. Trips? Was Was Trips there? Uh, No, Triple H didn't come in. I know it was Trips. (laughs) He didn't show up. (laughs) H. H to to two I, uh, yeah. Oh, that's wild, man. Yeah, well, he, then, the Baldo bomb. That's what I was trying to think of the yeah, name of the, yeah, <laughs> what he was going to give you. But then, like after the last thirty minutes, he would come over and say, "Okay, lay down. I want to show you something." And then he would just stretch me and like hit me and like just do crazy stuff to the point where I was going to school and like they called me to the guidance office and was like, "Is everything okay at home? Wow. You have a busted lip and like a, a bruised nose." And I'm like, "No, no, no. I'm okay. Seriously, it's not like that." Like, there's a 70, some old guys there's a 71 year old yeah. <laughs> it's actually an old guy yeah. not my parents yeah so it was kind of awkward and then was there any uh, was there any other younger people like who was the uh, who was the second youngest person there maybe some well there were always people like 18 fresh out of high school or like still in college that would come for a month and then they, you never see them again and then it got to the point where like obviously in wrestling like we know about this like weird camaraderie yeah. uh and it's hap- you know it happened with me I, and I've seen, you see it at different wrestling schools where there's like it's a team then right isn't yeah. it yeah, yeah everybody's together and so you're like this little like did you have a bunch of big brothers kind of like, kind of yeah well your real brothers were big brothers so I guess that's not weird to you right yeah I mean I was always like but even with sports you know you always look at his teams it was it was me Aaron Stevens uh, Wagner Brown mm. uh, Chad Chad Wicks okay. He was there for a little bit towards the end. And then there were some other guys, too, that aren't, aren't wrestling anymore. But then there was also a bunch of 25-year-olds and 30-year-olds, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. And that's what I'm saying is, like, the idea of you're a 14-year-old and now you have... I, I mean, so when I, when I started training, I remember, like, I was 18 and there was this, like, I don't know, 40-year-old black dude who, like, like it was a real human being. You know, I was just a mm, punk yeah. little fucking shithead. Exactly. And he had a job and he worked at the school and I just remember, oh, yeah. like, he had been wrestling there for years. Yeah. And uh, that relationship was always just like kind of awkward because you have nothing in common. Yeah, like, nothing except. in common. But we were, like he was, we were doing the same thing in the ring, so there was kind of a, there was a respect there. But mm-hmm. he was light had light years ahead of just real life experiences yeah. and being a real human. Whereas you're 14, you know, I was 18, you were 14. Yeah. So it's like they're respecting you, but also you're nothing to what like these guys have done in this world. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think I grew up quick too, just based off the circumstances of like my real life. So like having to fend for myself and like do certain things just to get money to whatever to mm-hmm. keep going. So I was at a more, well, you know, a different mentality than mm-hmm. the typical 13 year old. But I would record everything, and I had it. I'd bring this big V uh, like. It held the VHS tape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would set it up, and Kowalski, he didn't care. Even like if I was doing drills, I would like start recording, mm-hmm. and I'd hit, and then I would send it to WWE. Like this is what they're looking for. Ah. Oh, it's great. <laughs> they probably have a cole- a library of oh my, my stupidest training. They probably knew where I was every step of training. Right? Yeah. And I'm sure when Doctor Tom watched it, he was probably like, "Oh God, this kid again." Yeah. But then 
I was doing shows for Kowalski in a lot of local places. Hold on. Okay. So you're, when, when was your first match? At what age? 13. Wow. And yeah. what was your wrestling name? Ken Phoenix. I was going to say it had to be something stupid. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And did you get wrestling gear? Uh, I had like camouflage pants with like the yellow boots and stuff because I wasn't sure. Yellow wrestling boots? Yeah. So you had <clears throat> boots. But they were there. like the orangish yellow camo. Okay. But, but you, I mean, you bought wrestling boots, which yeah. aren't cheap. Exactly. Yeah. So you were putting more money into this yep. at 13. Yep. Kenny Phoenix. Yeah. And you were doing real, did you have a mask? No. No. Just a real. Yeah. I did. A, my first thing was a battle royal and I stepped on Doink's head. Which he shouldn't have bumped in the Battle Royal. You know, right. Now looking back, that's not on me. I love how you're mad about it now. Oh, yeah. 15 years later. Or Still, whatever it is. <laughs> the only spot I ever cared. <laughs> who, was you, playing, who was playing Doink that night? Fuck, Matt. The, Matt Bourne? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, he came up and was playing Doink, and he like, well, maybe he didn't bump, maybe he fell over. I yeah. <laughs> and I just wasn't paying attention. I stepped on his head, and he got so mad. He was like, who did that? Who did that? And he's going around asking people in the Rumble who did it. I was like, I didn't do it. And I'm like trying to wipe the paint on my boot on the apron. Like, get off, get off. Yeah, yeah. So then I went over to Wagner. I was like, quick, throw me out. And he's like, okay, see ya. So that was like my first experience. And then like, Kowalski you, would always have shows. I was going to say, and you were probably, if I know anything from that area, from watching MTV's real world, real life wrestling. Right, that was great, wasn't it? Uh, Kid USA. Yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, uh, there was all these, always probably all these names on those East Coast shows. Yeah. Like, and Tony Alice is the one that comes to my mind. That's of exactly that what I was thinking about. Yeah. And you're, again, you're, the idea is you're 13, 14, and there's all these, even Matt Bourne's a big name at that point. Yeah. Yeah. How do you handle yourself, like, with those guys in the locker room? Do you remember? I just, well, I, just I, I never really talked much. I would just always watch and learn and try to see what they did. You know what I mean? Because you get, like, giddy as a wrestling nerd that these guys were there, or? No, honestly, I've never. No. Yeah. Uh, well, I think maybe the first time when, like, you've the first time, like, when Perry Saturn comes walking in while you're getting stretched and you're like, you see him upside down because your head's t- twisted. Yeah. And you're like, oh my God, that's Saturn. Like, as you're getting hit in the face. Yeah. That, that was probably the only time. But luckily, I was in a position where he wouldn't realize I was all giddy about it. So. Okay. So, okay. So you started wrestling 13 years old, which is yeah. bizarre. <clears throat> Were people mad that they had to wrestle the 13 year old? I would um, be. There were some guys who would try to take liberties, yeah. like really hit you hard. But Kowalski used to always tell us, you hit somebody as hard as they hit you. So I would just feel like I'm hitting your little, Your little non-pubed body is throwing exactly. these yeah. shitty punches these horrible, as hard as you can. real punches and stuff. Which actually comes back to play, comes back to help me later, interestingly enough. I'll get to that too. Okay. But I would record everything. And I would send it to school or to uh, whatever it is, WWE. And I'd be in school. And one day I came home from school <clears throat> and my mother was like, there's somebody called. There's a message. I was like, who is it? She's like, uh, a doctor? She's like, you seen a doctor or something? I was like, what? what you? I don't know. So I looked and it was 203. And I was like, what the hell? And it was Dr. Tom. And he was like, Ken, I need you to call me, man. And that was about it. And I was like, oh, okay. So, and but you knew who Doctor Tom was. Yeah. Were you freaked out about that? Yeah. Yeah. How How old were you at this point? Uh, sixteen and a half, because I just got my license at like a week before. Okay. So, so you've been you've been wrestling perfectly. three and a half years at this point. At this point, yeah. And what were you doing? Were you doing it every single weekend? About every other. Okay. But Kowalski always had some. Souza had a lot up there, uh, and there was some other groups. There was like a group in Connecticut that ran out of a horse barn. Yeah. And I was wrestling in a horse barn. And you, I mean, you were a high school kid at this point. Mm-hmm. And so when you're 15, 16, you're starting to come, kind of come into your own as like a high school kid. Yeah. And instead of going to parties and stuff, you were going to... Oh, no, I'd still go to parties. Okay. If, if I didn't have a show, I would. Yeah. Yeah. And But what were your friends in high school? Like, what was the reaction to this stuff? Uh, A lot of people, like, they knew just by me saying it or that I was a fan. And they just, and eh, whatever. They just blew But it, it wasn't off. like a big known thing, like... Ken's a wrestler. Not until, not until Doctor Tom right. called me and was like, "Next week, Monday, Tuesday." He's like Philly, and I think he said Baltimore or something. He's like, "Can you make it?" And I was like, "Yeah, that's cool." And you were like, like, "Yeah, that's cool." Yeah, I was like, "Yeah, that's cool. I'll do it." <laughs> he's like, "You got plans then?" I was like, "Well, yeah, I, I gotta go to school, but I'll miss it obviously because I'm not. I'm yeah. just gonna skip. I'm fine. My grades are good." So then uh, he was like, "Oh, by the way." 
He's like, so... I'm surprised he allowed that. Well, here's what he said. He said, just subtract two years off your date of birth when you sign the papers. Uh, so I was like, okay, March 16, 1984. So then I went there, and what was great was every time I did it, I would always get chosen for TV. So my first time, I did the White Boy Challenge with Rodney Mack. <laughs> and it was just, yeah, it was I just remember cool. that. And I, I still talk to Rodney and Jazz. Like They're still really cool. See, he, he you were it. on TV at 16 and a half. Yeah, Monday Night Raw. They thought you were 18 and yeah. a half. And my school uh, thought I was sick that day. And <laughs> <laughs> did you and you and did you think, looking back, do you, do you think you look, were you like mature and tall for your age? Or? I was tall. You you probably would have thought I was like 18, 19. Okay. Yeah, because I would work out religiously mm-hmm. all the time. So I was like 2, 15 as a junior in high school. Okay. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, and so then you get on the, and then you go back to school, and people saw you, or you're like, or because well, how yeah. many people really watch wrestling? Like, well, uh, I guess a lot did. Okay, certain teachers that you didn't think would watch, yeah, were watching, yeah. Because what was was that on Raw or was that like a Heat thing? No, that was on Raw. Okay, fucking yeah. Hell. And then Tuesday, I worked, I think Ultimo Dragon on Velocity or something. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was great. And then I drove all the way back from Baltimore. And I didn't even go home. Did you have a car? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't even go home. It was a little beat up car. It was mm. rough. I, I'm surprised I made it. But I, I went straight to school. And as I walked in, they were doing the Pledge of Allegiance. So I was on time. And then after the Pledge of Allegiance, the, the uh, my teacher was like, to the office. And I was like, okay. And the dean of students was like, what? He's like, you weren't here the past two days. Where were you? And I was like... I was working, and he was like, you were. I saw it. He's like, good job. Hey. Yeah, and he's like, I'll make a deal with you. He's like, how often are you going to do this? And I said, I don't. honestly, I don't know. Maybe every other month, every three months, I don't know. He's like, if you keep an A, B average, I'll excuse those because it's technically work-related. Yeah. And I was like, That's cool. crazy. Deal. Yeah, I guess, like, you are allowed to – some high schools have this thing where you can, like, leave and work. Yeah. And that's crazy, that jobbing for WWF. Yeah, was in school, yeah. <laughs> so then uh, immediately, all the kids that would make fun of wrestling, yeah. now were like, oh, that he was, was a legend. Oh, yeah, it was great. The The kids loved it. I mean, but you always know who was shitting on it at first. Right. So it was just like, oh, cool, yeah, thanks. Did you have, like, lady groupies? Oh, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Like, I was super over. Oh, yeah, school. just the girls in the school. <clears throat> yeah. Of course, that's so wild. Yeah. Were you the youngest? Has that been decided? Were you the youngest person on WWF? To, like, what were the Hardys? Were they? I don't know. They were young too. But I don't think they were sixteen and a half. I don't think they were. You were technically sixteen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> God, I wonder. Looking back, is, uh, that's it. Would be an interesting question. It's nothing you ever looked into, huh? No. That's interesting. Because I don't know. Well, I guess if you could get, I, I think the only other person would probably be Jeff. Jeff Hardy, right? Yeah. But I, I think I heard he was seventeen, maybe. So then it might be. And then Dean Malenko was uh, refereeing at 12, I think. Or <laughs> yeah, I don't know, but that was... Probably, yeah. yeah, yeah his yeah. parents. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, then I would do those, and I would... Like, I worked Lance Storm on Heat. I worked... <laughs> this is all so weird to me. Yeah. Stevie Richards, Goldust, uh, Tajiri. Mm-hmm. Now, did, did they all think... Did you keep to, like, hey, I'm 18 the whole time? Yeah. So you always For stuck to that. You stuck to that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the, and then did you like form relationships with these guys? Because I remember when I was doing enhancement <clears throat> stuff, like at the first couple times, no one knows, and then you keep showing up, and they kind of get to know you, right? Well, it got to the point where they would ask to work with me. Mm-hmm. They were like, "Oh, he's back. Can I work with him? I want to work with him." And because and how that came about was my third time. It was me and Lance on Heat, and something happened, and they were like, "You got nine. and Lance was like, "We're gonna be okay," and I was like, "Yeah, we're, we're like." I'm listening to you. Don't think I'm going to start minutes. calling stuff. Right. Yeah, now we got nine minutes. He's like, oh, this will be fun. Wait, so it was originally something else and then it was It was originally four and then we got moved to nine in Gorilla. Gotcha. So now I'm thinking, oh my God, like that's a lot of time to be out there yeah. and an, a lot of opportunity to screw something up. <laughs> that's all I thought. But yeah. he ended up winning. I've had to put him over. <laughs> oh my God. What but were they, you wrestling? What was your enhancement names? Ken Phoenix. Always Ken Phoenix. Yep. Okay. And then when I came back, JR was back there and he was like is this something you really want to do and i was like absolutely like this is my dream job and he's like okay i, I just want to see where you're at mentally well, off of one question i don't know how but he did <laughs> and then uh oh i did a, i did another velocity match it was me and this other guy from new england versus billy gunn and bob holly and this was when they were just you know oh they're, they're tough dudes yeah so my partner starts to match off and they just beat the piss out <laughs> of him 
And I was like, oh, this is great. Here I come. So he tagged me in and Bob hit me. And then, you know, you don't want to like step on anybody's toes. So then I hit him back immediately, just as hard as he hit me. Yeah. And then he hit me again. And then I hit him back and he let me come out a little bit and get some. And then from there, it was just like easy, easy. And after the match, he even shook my hand. He was like, that's good. He said, I'm hitting hard. He goes, hit me back hard right. too. That's how I want it. And that's where and that, was like, that Kowalski yeah. lesson. And I remember too thinking like, well, I'm probably going to get my ass beat. That's a hard person to test that theory out against. Yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> but you know what's crazy is after like the second one is when I realized I that's what I realized that same exact thing. I was like, oh man, I don't know if this is where I should yeah. have tested this out. But Have I'm, you seen I'm Bob since? Fine. Yeah. Like now, like, because nowadays he's like this weird sweetheart. I don't know if you've seen him. He was always nice though. Yeah. It, because I mean, I don't know when I was there. You know, my or first whatever matches, yeah. he was still scary as fuck. And oh, I saw, he's intimidating. Yeah, and I saw him get, like, pissed at people, and I was like, God, I don't even know if I should shake his hand, you right. know? Right, some people, yeah, you're nervous. Yeah, but then I was like, well, if I don't shake his hand, then he's going to be like, why didn't you shake my hand? You're going to fuck it. I, you think of a hundred different ways yeah. you're screwing yeah, yeah, up. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the era, you know, so a couple of years before that is probably when that was happening with you, yeah. where he was probably in, like, that fucking wild mode of, like, mean old Bob yeah. Holly. Same feeling, too, like, if you see certain people in catering, mm-hmm. I, I want to shake your hand. But I know you're eating, so you could get mad that I'm yeah. missing. Like, oh. that you're such in a dilemma. Yeah. Or, oh, yeah, you saw me in catering, and then you walked away. Did you know those politics as a 16-year-old? I knew you know them as... I saw it take place. That's how I learned it. As a 16-year-old? Yeah. Like, with who or why or what? Just, like, random extras would get yelled at by people for whatever reason. Gotcha. And I would always... I would try to get there early so I could eat, and then I'd go sit in the stands and wait. So that way, I would get so you didn't have to be around time. those people. So that way, I didn't walk in when they were eating, ah, and then I put myself in that position. Yeah, I get there early, eat, go sit and wait, and then when they're all done eating and they come out, then I can walk around and shake. Gotcha. Know? It's yeah. a good theory. Yeah, good it's theory. Just in and out early, easy. So, I think I still do it. But <laughs> so Jim Ross, with one question, ask me a psychology test. I guess. Right. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. And then does he sign you up? Nope. So, so then I come back, uh, WrestleMania 20, I was a druid for Taker. Oh, we have something in common. Mania druid duty. Which WrestleMania? The one in Chicago. I don't know what number it was. I don't, what number are they on now? 30-something? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe well, 23? That one, it was me. It was Chad Weeks. Chad Wicks. It was the heartthrobs. <clears throat> there was a few of us that ended up get, going to OVW. Chicago one? Uh, MSG. Oh, okay. WrestleMania 20. Oh, gotcha, 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 gotcha. But... So then after that, WrestleMania is all over, and then Johnny pulls me into his office. John Laurinaitis. Yeah. Who you sound exactly like right now. I know. It's great. <laughs> You're doing his impression. I'm just going to start calling people and hiring them. <laughs> uh, so he calls me in. He says, uh, can you go to Louisville? I said, yeah, I can go. He's like, I want to hire you. Wait, how old were you? 16. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I just turned 18. Okay. That's right. Yeah, because it was, it was like a few days after my 18th birthday. Did, uh, but not graduated high school? Not yet. Okay. So I was like, yeah, I can go. Oh, yeah, Mania's in April. Yeah, but you probably will graduate in a couple of days or weeks. Yes, exactly. Okay. June, yeah. So he's like, I want to hire you. I need you to go to Louisville. And I said, well, okay. I said, well, I graduate in June, so let me just finish school, and then I can go. And he's like, how old are you? What are you talking about graduate from what? And I was like, high school. <laughs> and he's like, how old are you? I said, I'm 18. He goes, when's your birthday? I said, March 16th. He's like, you just turned 18 like four f- whatever days ago. I said, yeah. And he's like, you've been working for me for two years. And now you're 18. <laughs> I said, if I was going to sue you, it would have happened a lot sooner, don't you think? That's like, what you said? Yeah. Like, we always had, like, this weird relationship where we were just talk to each other like that. Right, to the point where you now sound like him. Exactly. See, right. I'm becoming him. <laughs> uh, my skateboard's in there. <laughs> get through customs. Um, so then he was like, oh, well, that's bullshit that you were working for me at a young age. And I was like, okay, well, I, I was like, how about I go in June? And he's like, we'll talk about it later. And I was like, well, okay, well, call me then because I'll be ready. And he's like, what makes you think I'm going to hire you? I was like, because you're going to hire me right now. Yeah. So what? now that you realize I'm even younger than you thought I was, why wouldn't you hire me? And he's like, I'll talk to you. And I was like, all right, see you. Well, you, you weren't scared. No, I, I didn't really care because I always have the impression. You can't fire me if I'm not, you know. But you were hired and then he told kind you, of, right? you said your age fired, and then yeah. you were almost fired without any paperwork. <laughs> exactly. So, well, then he called me in May. It was like the end of May. He offered me a job. So I had my contract before I even graduated high school. So I graduated June 7th, and my first day at OVW was June 14th. 
That's wild. So, yeah. I just packed everything. And, all right. That's now, cool. it's kind of crazy because now you're finishing up your second MBA. Mm-hmm. MBA? MBA. Yeah. And, like, you know, your college was was OVW, was pro wrestling. Like, was yeah. there a bit of you that was like, I, I'd like to go to college? I mean, obviously, I yeah, know you want to go I've always to- had, I always want to get a degree. Yeah. Just something to fall back on and, you know, do and... But, I mean, obviously, you loved wrestling and that's what you wanted to do and you wanted to fall back on plan. Yeah. But you were, you know, you were 18. So did you think that, like, maybe there wasn't success in your cards? Because you seem very confident, like, going into all of this. Does that make sense? Oh, like like something might not work out? Yeah. No, not really. I think everything is going to work out. I, there's never an option for it not to. Well, then what's the want of a, a college degree then at that? Well, because we can't wrestle forever. Oh. Injuries happen. So that's more of my mindset on it's it. It's just the thoughts of in like the event. when I'm 35 or 40 and I'm not yeah. I'm not in the main event of WrestleMania anymore. <laughs> yeah, in the event type <laughs> yeah. thought. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can do something else. Okay. Because I'm always the type, like, even when I have off days, they're not really off days because I find other projects and stuff that I want to do and try and explore. Mm-hmm. So I'm always dabbling in something, some craziness. But yeah, that was my thought. But it was college, and I always knew I'd go back to college at some point. I just want... You know, I'm always the type where if I'm not 100% sure, I don't do it. And I just have to wait for the right thing. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to rack up loans and stuff. So the way I went to college was I would look up job openings that were good for my mother so she could have another job. So she ran the dining hall at the college, and then, like, your kids get free tuition. So oh, I, got, really? I got her a job at the at school in the dining hall. This was after your WWE run. Yeah, yeah, that's so smart. And then six months later, when everything kicked in, that's when I started school. Oh wow! And got my degree with <laughs> a free education. Yeah, because yeah. mom was at the dining hall. Exactly. And you had the money to probably go to college. Yeah, but right. I mean, why not rock the system a little? Why not? Yeah, that's, sm- that's not rock the system. But <clears throat> yes, that's fun. Yeah. Um, so when you showed up to OVW. And you were eighteen. Who's the other? Who's the second youngest person there? Maybe Chris Masters at twenty-one. Okay. And again, was that the same? The idea of like, you're here, you're the kid here. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Did you yeah. feel it hard to fit in, or did you? No, because I just did my. Well, I knew, I knew if I was given the opportunity that I would be able to do and show that I can work. And Jim Cornette. First thing he said was, you a heel or a baby face? I said, ah, usually I'm a heel. He said, you're never going to make money as a heel. You're a baby face. So then I had this idea to turn myself heel. And the way I did that was we did like a tournament where it ended in like me and Snooka. And we were both baby faces. Uh, so when Sim he won. Snuka. Yeah. That's because so of he, Jimmy Snooka. W- yeah. <laughs> yeah. 60 year old man. I worked him too. So yeah. it's kind of weird. <laughs> so when he went over, then I just like threw a fit. Cornette said get mad after just be mad about it you know I was like okay but I took that as I'm gonna throw chairs I'm gonna tip over the commentator's desk and just have a huge fit and turn heel you did it on your own yeah and that was one of those things where I could say oh I'm sorry I thought you said get mad right be mad so where does the idea that you never you have you seem to never second guess yourself or never like care what the the repercussions are does that Absolutely. make sense? Yeah. Like, that's the sense I kind of get. Yeah. Well, I mean, there are repercussions. Like, I do think big picture, like, what is it if it's really affecting a lot? Yeah. But, I mean, if it's something like if someone's losing sleep over something I say or do, then they probably need more hobbies or something. Right. Like, so it's always on them. It's never on you. Oh, no. I know I ruffle feathers. Yeah. But I always do it. And, too, because I'm very, I, I try to have the old school mindset of, where this business, you know what I mean? Like kayfabe. Yeah. So if I have a platform to say something and I have an opportunity to still be perceived as a heel, you know what I mean? Like you ever seen matches? You, I mean, you've seen shows where you go, that was a great show, but that bump that he took, that was real. Sure. But you're in a system that is eggshell based. Oh, I know. That, um, you know, people are worried about getting fired over the dumbest things. And you're like, I'm just... And they say, "Hey, throw a fit," and you're like, "I'm gonna ruin these guys' set for for the sake of like turning heel, doing a thing." 
<clears throat> and if knowing if they don't like it, you're fired, right? Like that's kind oh, yeah, of I'm pretty screwed. Yeah, pretty screwed. I, but I would say, you know, in my mindset, it was always like, if they don't like this, they're just going to be like, this guy sucks. It's actually kind of happened to me. I, I, you know, they were. I think so, Kevin Dunn saw me on TV. He was like, I don't like this guy. You're fired. So like, it's crazy. That's the word. You know, <laughs> that's dumb. But you didn't have. You don't seem that. You never. It doesn't seem like you have that. That was in your head. No, yeah, didn't even cross my mind. Right, and I'm kind of curious, like, why not? Well, I just thought, I'm going to do this until the crowd really boos the shit out of me. And then I'll go backstage because I'll walk back there with the reaction. As opposed to if the crowd just did nothing or just, like, didn't care. Yeah, but what if you ruin this guy's fucking set? Well, I I didn't go that far. Okay. (laughs) But I, like, slam chairs and, like, I think I kicked cornbread, one of the kids there. Mm. And my, I love the idea that I know what you're talking about. Yeah, and people have no. He kicked cornbread, but, but you just kicked a piece of cornbread. That yeah. was <laughs> 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 there's a guy named Cornbread. Yeah. Uh, okay, and then uh, like I mean I know and I saw a lot of your stuff down there, uh, and so I mean we're, we're kind of not almost running out of time here, but um, was Spirit Squad your like? Were you happy going up as that? Or did you have like this idea of like I'm gonna be Kenny Phoenix? Uh, you know, well, what's weird is they brought me up and I did a whole bunch of house shows as Ken Doan. Just use my real name. Twenty year old kid, nineteen. 19? God damn. Eighteen and a half, nineteen. Yeah. yeah, and I was doing all these uh, like loops and stuff as Ken Doan, and it was getting a good reaction. But then there, Vince was like, "I want male cheerleaders," and I thought it was a rib, really. And then after he we left the meeting, we were like, "He's serious. He wants this." So I was kind of like, oh, because, you know, always being the athletic and stuff like that growing up, playing sports, the last thing you ever think is going to be a male cheerleader. Hmm. And then I was like, screw it. If that's what they want, we're just going to do it better than anybody else could. So that's kind of where that all came from. But you get comfortable with it after a while. Mm -hmm. And once you figure out as you get older and you realize, you know, how to work better and each day you get better. But as you realize that and get a better grasp. The gimmick is great because it's, it's a gift. It's right. a gift, yeah. yeah. It's like you or man. like yeah. you know what I mean. Like, well, I always said like I wanted a honky tonk man gimmick where you great. could just do it forever. Yeah. <laughs> but hold on, so you I, and I, you know, got, I've had Mondo and Nemeth on here both, but you went into they said Vince, you went into that meeting, but Vince said I need cheerleaders, so they somebody picked out five, yeah, right, yeah. And so when they said to you, you're one of, did they say you're one of the five? Well, Was they brought it? us all in at the same time. It was me. Nick Mitchell, Nick Nemeth, Johnny Jeter, and Elijah Burke. Mm-hmm. Who and like Danny Davis or yeah, they sent us up uh, from Louisville. They were in Cincinnati. And so they, we had did to they tell you what was going on? No, they, they said they want to meet with you. So somebody, I wonder what have you heard since? Like, was there like a list and someone went down it and that I don't know honestly. That's kind of, I have no idea. Okay, that I don't know. And so that the first time in the meeting with Vince. You didn't know what was going on. There's just four or five guys there. Yeah, all five of us. Okay. And then he sprung that on you? Yeah, and Taz <clears throat> Taz was in the office in the back doing something, and Taz even looked up and started giggling. <laughs> That's what made me think it was a joke. Yeah. And then he was like, no, I'm serious. I want five male cheerleaders. He's okay, like, so... The, and he the, says, this is going to work. I promise you, this is going to work. So your, your, obviously your reaction, the exterior reaction is obviously... You're excited because it's Vince McMahon and you say whatever. Yeah. But inside, like that first that first reaction. I think I was my first reaction was this is great. We're getting we're gonna be on TV. Okay. We're getting called up. Gotcha. But then when it started to digest, I'm gonna be a male cheerleader. <laughs> I was like, Ugh, you get that like butterfly. The first lines. reaction <clears throat> was like and that makes sense. Yeah, like yeah. he's behind something. Because all you you were just a schmuck just exactly doing yeah. just tour. doing jobs and whatever. Right. Yeah. yeah. Fun. Yeah. And it was uh and that was, and then, uh, and Kenny Dextra was Lenny Dykstra. Yeah, that was, I, and you know what's crazy is after the squad, I tried convincing them to send me back to Louisville or FCW. That was my whole thing. I said, I, I, it's great that we're on TV, but I don't want to be because I want people to just forget about it, the whole thing. Mm-hmm. If we come back real quick, you can't, you can't come back from that in a week. And I was back the next week. So, and then that didn't end so up. So you saw that as a, as a negative, you realized, huh? Yeah. I mean, but you had a nice. You, they were trying to push you. Yeah, yeah, we did for a little bit. But just what the, you think the stigma of? Uh, I don't know. You know, I, I mean, I know the night that I worked Flair, I went over on Flair, and then that's the same night Hunter retours at Leg, and then the next night Arn said they're moving Flair with Sean. He said, "So I don't know where that's going to leave you." <laughs> <After, laughs> that's pretty much it. After a nice victory over I mean, Rick Flair, yeah, 
Yeah. So then I did some stuff with Carlito for a little bit. And then I pitched a few ideas to work with Bobby. And my, my thing with Bobby was I've worked with him in OVW, so I know what he can do. Mm-hmm. And he was still new at the time. And he was they had him with guys like Test and Holly. And I went to Stephanie, actually. I said, I know what you're trying to do. I said, you guys want Bobby to be a monster? I said, but he's working against monsters. I said, so it's kind of hard to do. I said, I worked with him in OVW. I said, I know you guys have footage of it. I said, I can make him look like a million dollars and still get over at the same time. Mm-hmm. And she was like, okay, well, I'll think about it. And then the next week, she was like, you have 15 minutes on Raw with Bobby, and you got one commercial break. Okay. How'd so it go? It was great. Yeah. We got we got Oh, I was telling Mono this yesterday, the other day on the bus. He Bobby had the flu that day. So Finley was our agent, but you know, we planned most of the whole thing. And then as you when you lose the match, you go off to the side, you come back around up the gorilla to find your guy and say, Hey, th- cool, thanks. I came up the stairs at the same time Bobby came in from the ramp and he, standing ovation. Everybody stood up standing. But then I realized nobody was looking at me. Yeah. <laughs> so I just joined in on the applause too. And I was you like, did you, great. I was like, you Bobby, did so you good. were good. You were good. Yeah. I was like, you did so good. You were great. Oh. It was funny. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I popped at it. Yeah, yeah. But you realize your position. Uh, yeah. yeah. It, right there, I realized. Of course. Okay. Of course. But I, I did what I said I would do, and they liked it. Yeah. So. And then, um, so recently you guys have done some stuff. Yeah. Did that go, that go, went away already? What? Are you guys not on TV anymore? I don't, you know what? You never know. We're still on the website. Are you? On the Superstar page. Okay. The roster. Oh, there you go. But I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? Although, I will say this. They do return emails and texts still. So when that stops, then I, I feel like, okay. Fair enough. Yeah. There you go. Occasionally, like every other week, I'll send a text to Carano or something. Mm-hmm. Just to, oh, he replied. Good. Right. That's good. Uh, so, but, I mean, and then you got, what, did you get fired? Did you? Yeah. Were yep. you in a mass firing, or was it just you? No, it was me, uh, I think Elijah, I don't know, there, but there was a few of us. Okay. Because everybody was texting each other. Right. Y- so one of those, like yeah. yeah. So it was like a big group of us that got released. And um, what was like? What was the reaction, what was the life plan afterwards, like what was your... Get ready for school. So you knew, did uh, you see it coming? Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Because I was on house shows and dark matches all the time. And it was always the next person to come up. So it was me and Kofi, me and Cody Rhodes, me and DiBiase, me and who the next guy that's coming up, mm-hmm. which was cool because they're all great workers. So I got to do like a few loops with them, a few tours overseas and stuff like that. But it wasn't the biggest shock in the world. It was no, yeah, I wasn't shocked. Yeah, and but, you were ready. And you know, too, looking at the card, okay, you know what direction are they going with these guys? Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, you see it. And unless you're naive and you just think tomorrow right. they're going to push but then you. you kind of you, you I know you did some stuff with like Gabe right away, but then you kind of fizzled mm-hmm. off the indie scene a little bit. Yeah. And um, which is it's not not weird. Uh, but like I know like you're like you're one of these guys who loved wrestling as a kid. Yeah. And you were instilled so early. So I don't know if it's like burnout from being on such a big platform at such a young age. That's why you kind of stop a little bit. I think it was more just like. I never knew anything outside of that from 13 to 24 when I got fired. Mm-hmm. I never knew the outside world, you know, because every day you wake up and it's like, the outside oh, what's world, the real wrestling life or, world? or wrestling? I would never knew. Well, I was always in the wrestling world, so I wanted to take myself away from that for a little bit. Okay. I, I thought you meant like the indies, but you're saying like in real life. And just, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And just, you know, see what else the world has offered, things that I might not be noticing. Mm-hmm. And that's when I wrote my book and, you know, did a bunch of other stuff and small ventures and uh, all different stuff. Do you like the outside world? Yeah. I know nothing about it, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, t- I teach uh, business. So, like, when I was the director at the nonprofit, I would go and teach, like, women and, like, these women shelters and stuff. Teach them how to start a business, how to run a business, how to market, how to campaign, how to raise funds, how to do all that stuff. Mm. How to set up LLC and corporations, all that teach them all those things so that way they could use that and i would go to the unemployment offices and uh do classes uh this week when i get back i'm looking into going into the prisons and teach the prisoners these same courses so that way when they get out hopefully we can do the analysis and look and see over time if the return rate drops Mm. because right now it's roughly 51 percent of inmates that leave come back is this through you this is through a a company that you work for or this is your own this is my own Independent study, <laughs> yeah, my own independent stuff. But the the states will, the government will pay for you to come in and teach the course. 
Okay. So if you have a reasonable rate and a reasonable thing that you do. But you figured out how to figure out that the state will exactly do it. Yeah. I don't like working for people who can make more money off of me. Mm. And I always tell people this, your job, you work eight hours a day, it takes you an hour to get to work. Hour back, that's 10 hours out of a 24-hour day, plus you sleep eight, roughly. Mm. That's 18 hours. How much time do you really have for yourself? Or are you working to make somebody else money? Mm. No one's going to hire you at X amount of dollars an hour if it's costing them money. Right. So if they're not making money off of you, then and whatever they hire you for, just know that there's a way to make more because they're making it. I always have that mind, not, maybe not that mindset, but I, I always think of like, well, if I'm making this, then they have to be making bags. exactly, yeah. And, and if I'm doing the work, if I'm right. the horse here, yeah, and you're the whip, it, and you're making more, that it, it doesn't, it just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, I can't fathom that. It cr- drives me crazy. You're right. But yeah. I'd rather do something that I love to do, 24 hours a day, and get paid be the only one that gets a paycheck out of mm-hmm. it than do something which is weird because like, I've had these thoughts too man and sometimes when I say them out loud it kind of sounds selfish but it's also like why yeah I know yeah. I I know like in my heart it's not Yeah. but like if you say it out loud it doesn't sound selfish it just sounds like greedy doesn't it you, you can kind hear of. it sounding a little like I want all the money you know but you well, put in the work you deserve the it, money yeah. Yeah. I've done seminars I've done hour seminars where I've rented like a VFW hall for $150 and then I'll take $50 and I'll do advertising on Facebook to a certain demographic that I'm looking for in that area. And then I'll sell, it holds 150 people. I'll sell it out with $10 a ticket of how to start business, how to invest your money, how to save your money. And people will come and I'll have a little speaker and a microphone <laughs> and a presentation up and I'll talk to people and I'll just give them all this advice. This is a real thing? Yeah. So I spend really 150 in the hall to uh, extra 50 on advertisement. That's 200. Mm-hmm. I sell 150 tickets. That's 1500. It's really 1300 profit. Yeah. And I'll even buy a bunch of cases of water so they can take them as they come and go. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is legitimate. This is indie wrestling without the ring. Without the ring. Is that where you think you had a little? Do Probably you think so. You, do yeah. you think you got that from like business school or from independent wrestling? Or like, of, or like well, Kowalski? How to set it up? Yeah. Indie wrestling. How to teach the subject? Business school. It's business <laughs> yeah. school, yeah. So it's a good mix. Yeah, oh, man. So I'd rather make 1300 an hour than yeah. 10 so. But there's people who won't want to put in that kind of work or think of that or be exactly yeah, yeah. of course I I can get a million dollars if uh, if I can get a million people to give me a dollar I'm probably not gonna find one person to give me a million dollars though right you know that's that's interesting I've had that same mentality for for independent wrestling mm-hmm. where I, I like whatever it is like I think there's some like the Ultimate Warrior will charge you know a hundred thousand dollars for one match or whatever. Fifty dollars a picture. Yeah, but I'll you know I'll make that money by working three hundred days a year you know for exactly. fifty bucks a match and you know or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've always had that mentality, so you know, we're yeah. like minded a little small, bit. Small, uh, small scale, but you know if you do it right and you get the right. And nowadays too, with your stuff and merchandise and all that, you know there's all these different websites. There's all these different. Mm-hmm. eBay, Amazon, that you can always do this. Seven streams, baby. Seven streams. Seven streams. <laughs> That's what we learned today. Uh, cool. Where so, where are you at on the internet? And then do you have other stuff outside? Like what? Tell me, you, I mean, plug the book and stuff too, or whatever yeah. you want to yeah, plug. My children's yeah. book, Billy's Bully. That's a kids book, and I do actually. I have another, a few school appearances coming up in March, so I'll go there, and the school will buy X amount of books and I'll talk to the kids. What, the book's stuff. called Billy's Bully? Billy's Bully, yeah. And it's yep. on Amazon or anything? It's or? on Amazon. Uh, it's in Barnes & Nobles. Some Barnes & Nobles. It's uh, Independently it published? Uh, Mascot Books published it. And you scammed them into publishing it for you? Nope. I sold sponsorship. What does that mean? Meaning in the book, there's uh, you know the kids wearing a certain t-shirt. Yeah. There's certain references in there. To Mascot publishing to, yeah no but you had to get mascot publishing to be the publisher oh yeah no no the sponsor is nichols college that's what it is okay they sponsored the book so the first page is an ad of them nichols college yeah and then throughout the book it has nichols college like the logo yeah but the, the publishing company is mascot and the publishing yeah they published it though because of the tie-in with nichols because nope it was independently published if that's what you're asking yeah that yeah. is so yeah. they funded it yeah gotcha yeah Oof, what a hustler man yeah, so I paid zero. And right. I make all the profits. So. <laughs> and a boy. <laughs> exactly. And it works great. Um, okay. And then do I you... do fitness competitions. So I do that. And I also do fitness consults at the gyms and stuff. So I help people get back on track. And I do that through my Instagram a lot at Ken Doan, K E N N D O A N E. And then my Twitter is at Ken Doan, which is usually just like smart ass comments. Mm. Each one's its own thing. My Facebook is more like to connect with my family and stuff. Okay. My Twitter is like my smart ass comments, which hopefully people don't get upset by. 
that which they I probably really don't do. Mean anything by them? No harm. Yeah. And my Instagram is more like my fitness oriented stuff. Right. So whatever you're into. So whatever you're into, there's a stream. Yeah, and if so, if you're Ken's mom listening, you should follow him <laughs> <Right>. on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, cool, man. This is an interesting story. Yeah, this was fun. fun. I hope you had a good time. I did. Thank you for having me. Thanks for I appreciate uh, it. Thanks for being on. All right, Ring of Honor television spoilers are coming right now. If you don't want to hear them, do a 15 second, 15 second forward right now. Okay, Kenny showed up on Ring of Honor television and uh, had a really fun match and a really fun segment. So that's cool. Still doing it, still out there getting it done. Okay, unspoiler, that sounded like 15 seconds to me in my head. Give him a tweet. Let him know you liked it if you liked it. If not, just uh, go on to the next one. Like we've done every single week. Before we get out of here, let's get into some plugs and upcoming events. All right, the best way that you can support ColtMerch.com, DigitalColt.com, Twitter and Instagram, at Colt Cabana, Facebook slash AOW Podcast and slash Colt Cabana. My storytelling podcast, the one with Les Kell at Pro Wrestling Fringe, plus past archives of this show. They're ad-free and they're on Howl.fm slash Colt. Use that code Colt. Get yourself a free month. ColtWrestling at gmail.com is my very public email. I also got a YouTube channel. Always throwing stuff up there. ColtCabana.com is my website. You can find my P.O. box on there. I love getting snail mail. Upcoming Friday, April 28th, Saturday, April 29th, Sunday, May 7th, Wednesday, May 10th, Friday, May 12th, Sunday, May 14th, Milwaukee, Minneapolis, Detroit, Toronto, New York, and Philadelphia, ROH Wrestling.com. I think I'm doing commentary for all of those, so don't expect me to wrestle, but I will be wrestling on these shows Sunday, April 30th, Austin, Texas, WrestleCircus.com, Friday, May 5th, Clive, Iowa, ProWrestlingRevolver.com, Saturday, May 6th, Chicago, Illinois, I'm doing that free podcasting taping at 4 p.m., Brick and Brack Records in Logan Square, and that night, doors are at 6, AAWrestling.com, Saturday, May 13th, Westbrook, Maine, LimitlessWrestling.com, Friday, May 19th, Lakewood, Ohio, OldWrestling.com, that's old with an E, and Saturday, May 20th, Rahway, New Jersey, WrestleProOnline.com. Heading back to Rahway. It's been a while. Very excited to go see that crew. Always, always, always a great show. And this has been a great show. Happy we did it. Happy that you listened to it. Big thank you to you at home for listening, as always. Thanks to Kenny Doan slash Kenny Dextra. Thanks to Kevin Guy Jeff and Stu Stone, Kid Russell, Matt Jenkins with music. Dane Miller helped me with a tech debacle. Highspots.com are a sponsor. Hundreds of full-length titles available to download. A VOD service with all that PWG goodness on there. $5 wrestling, AMA knee pads, gear, mask, a wrestling ring. How about one hour tees.com? They help run pro wrestling. Crate.com. They help run pro wrestling. Tees.com. That's where you can support your favorite independent wrestler. And tweakedaudio.com slash Colt, the earbuds that I use. Get over 30% off and free shipping just because you listen to this show. What do you think of the odds that I'm going to read that Justin Roberts book, right? I mean, it's been sitting here, but I don't know. I don't know if I get into it. I want to read it so bad, but there's just Fargo and Better Call Saul, and there's some Netflix stuff, and there's just, ugh. I'm thinking about buying CISO. Any of you guys buy CISO? I've been thinking about watching some CISO stuff. There's a lot of good stuff on there. So, you know, now you know what's filling up my brain. But reading... One day I'll get to reading. Not now, though. Maybe next week. We'll see you next week. This has been The Art of Wrestling. For Colt Cabana, I'm Colt Cabana. Thanks.